Vous avez publié il y a quelques mois « Le prisonnier du ciel », le troisième euh, volet de votre tétralogie « Commencer avec l'ombre du vent ». Comment est-ce que vous pourriez présenter ce nouveau roman Well, I would say that it's uh, another piece in this big labyrinth of stories that begins with L'Ombre de Vent and then with uh, The Angel's Game. And now this is the third novel in this idea of some kind of a Chinese box of stories. My original idea was that you could, as a reader, enter this box, this labyrinth, from any of the different doors that there are. So you could begin now with uh, The Prisoner of Heaven, or you could go back to Uh, the angel's game, or you could go back to in the shadow of the wind. It depends, depending on what way you pick up your experience as a reader is going to be different. Or you can read them in the order they are written and published, which is what what most people are going to do. So this is this is the place where the story really gets interesting because finally, after two novels, we really get to the center, to the point of what the mystery behind all these novels is. So the novel, The Prisoner of Heaven, takes us into the gates of the labyrinth of stories and reveals many of the terrible secrets that many of the characters have been hiding and also takes us to the also to the to the birch of the grand finale that will be the fourth the fourth novel. Vous dites que c'est un roman plus humoristique mais c'est aussi un roman qui parle d'une période sombre de l'histoire espagnole la période du franquisme le, l'histoire se passe une partie de l'histoire en tout cas se passe en 1939 juste après la guerre civile pourquoi avoir voulu centrer cette histoire sur le, un petit peu le moment le plus sombre qui soit de la, la période franquiste well the identity of fermin romero de torres this character is very much linked to the history of spain through the 20th century and we could say also to the history of europe through the 20th century with these ups and downs with this terrible tragedies world war II, the spanish civil war and The secret that Fermin is holding that has to do with his own identity, with the man he has become, is hidden in the worst times in the history of Spain in the 20th century, which is right after the Spanish Civil War. This is the time of revenge. The Franco regime has won the war. And at that time, because in Europe, World War II is beginning, the Franco regime assumes that maybe... Probably, even in Europe, everybody thought that in 1939, even in 1940, that the Germans were going to win the war. It wasn't obvious until probably 1941, 1942, that they were going to lose the war. It was only a matter of time. And once the Americans got in, it was a matter of industrial might. So sooner or later, they would lose the war. But nobody thought so in 1939 or in 1940. What happened? Franco, who was an extremely practical man, thought at that time that Europe was going to become some kind of fascist theme park. So he may not have to answer to history. So he he imagined that the entire world was going to be a very different world from the world that turned out to be at the end of World War II. This is why the revenge from the Spanish Civil War was so terrible and why so many people were in prison and murdered and, and so many horrendous things happening in Spain in 1940. Shortly after that, once Franco realized that his allies were going to lose the war, he changed bands and he became the friendly dictator in the south of Europe who was a friend of Eisenhower and invited, please put your bases plane and your military bases here and your planes. I'm, I'm the friendly guy. And actually he died in bed 40 years later. So, so he knew which, which cards he was playing. But this takes us to a very, to a terrible time, especially in the city of Barcelona, because Barcelona had been the capital of the rebellion against against Franco. So in this terrible castle that overlooks the city of Barcelona, the the, the Montjuic Castle, a military fortress, terrible things happen. And it turns out that Fermín Romero de Torres was there at the worst of times, and he has a, a terrible story to tell us. And even though we go back to the most dramatic and tragic times in Spanish history in the 20th century, because it is Fermín who is telling us the story, we see things through his eyes. So there's always, uh, even in these tragic circumstances, a certain humor, a certain satire, a way of looking at things that comes from his own personality. That's why there's this big contrast of darkness and light, because this comes with, with the personality of Fermín. Vous parlez de vengeance, vous parlez de prison. Il y a un roman qui combine à merveille ces deux euh, thématiques. C'est le conte de Monte Cristo de Dumas, auquel vous rendez hommage dans ce roman. Autre par autrefois, vous aviez aussi rendu hommage à Dickens, à Victor Hugo également. Est-ce que vous vous réclamez de cette grande tradition du roman populaire du 19e siècle 
Well, in many ways, one of the things I'm trying to do with this cycle of novels is to, of course, pay homage to, to these grand novels of the 19th century, the greatest novels ever written with these fantastic writers, Dumas, Dickens, Balzac, Zola, etc., Victor Hugo. And, uh, and one of the things I always wanted to do with this was to take that great model of the 19th century novel and deconstruct it to the slight, to the s smallest parts, like you take an engine and you just, you know, put a, disassemble all the engines, and then you assemble it again, but using all the things we've learned th through through the engineering of storytelling through the 20th century, which are a lot, because the 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 when you go back and you think about the the audiences, the the readers of Dumas or Victor Hugo, these readers had never seen a movie, had never seen TV, had never seen a comic book. They didn't know advertising, commercial photography, graphic design, all those things. They didn't know about it. They, their the range of codes they could absorb in terms of a storytelling was very limited. Nowadays, readers, every one of us, has grown up with such an array of tremendous tremendously rich narrative languages, we are able to decode all these things instinctively. We don't even have to think about it. So what I'm trying to do is take this grand tradition of the 19th century novel and try to rebuild it and re-engineer it, but using things we've learned through the 20th century, and there are many, and, and call it sentence, because if we, if we think of a storytelling sentence, we think that technology only applies, I don't know, to cell phones and computers and cars and planes, but technology itself, the, the appliance of technique, of, of knowledge of how to do things also applies to storytelling. And there's a lot of technology in the storytelling that has evolved through the 20th century. And essentially what I'm trying to do is take that and re-engineer all the great classic literary tradition. And of course, I'm paying homage to these great writers and I'm trying to invite readers to rediscover these great works because to me, they are still the reference for modern storytelling. Le Prisonnier du Ciel est le troisième livre de la série, ce n'est pas le dernier. Il y a un quatrième que je crois vous écrivez pour l'instant. Que pouvez-vous nous dire sur ce futur livre Well, I can't reveal much, otherwise I would have to murder you. <laughs> And I don't want to do that, I'm a nice person. So what I can say is that the fourth novel of the series is going to be the biggest of them all, the most complex, because it's the grand finale, it's the operatic grand finale, where all the pieces in the labyrinth are going to click together. And even though maybe the readers of The Prisoner of Heaven by the end of it may think that now they know what's going on. Now we really know what's the secret hidden in the heart of the labyrinth. The truth is that there are many more twists to this story. And in the same way that each one of the books makes you reinterpret the story again of the previous novels, uh, the final one is going to reveal the grand design of why this labyrinth of stories is the way it is, why all the pieces are set like that. So hopefully this will be, that's my ambition, the best and, and most entertaining and probably the darkest and on the same time the most entertaining of them all because it's the final piece that makes everything click and gives the final meaning to, to the series. But it's under construction and I cannot really reveal any more, not its title, nor the plot, uh, because that's the way I work. I keep changing everything and rewriting everything and when it's done, it's done. Beaucoup de vos lecteurs espèrent un jour une adaptation à l'écran de, de cette série, que ce soit au cinéma ou dans une série télévisée. Est-ce que c'est quelque chose que vous aimeriez voir un jour arriver sur l'écran Well, over the years, there have been many offers to turn these books into movies or TV series, and there have been many people interested in doing so. A lot of these people are people I've known, that I'm friends with, that I respect, and I know that they mean well. That, and, 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 and some of these offers have come from the people I respect most in the film industry. So the problem is not that. Why I have said no, I always said that I didn't want to turn these books into movies or TV series. There are a number of reasons for this. One of them is that because I've been inside the kitchen, I used to work for a few years as a screenwriter. I know how the factory works. I know how things are cooked. I know what happens. So I don't have a romantic view of the film industry, as many writers do. Many writers, when their work gets optioned or sold to the movies, they go, oh, they're going to make a movie out of my book. It's going to be wonderful. And I say, well, it depends. You know, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And this is one of the reasons that makes me more cautious and perhaps I have a more realistic view of, of what it means to adapt a book into a film or a TV series. 
That said, even though I have nothing against the movies, in fact, part of my life has been devoted to them, and also or against TV series. As a matter of fact, probably some of the best storytelling of the last 10 years has happened in dramatic TV series, and this has to be a knowledge. The thing is that I also believe that not everything needs to become a movie or a TV series. I think that sometimes there are pieces of literature that are fine as they are. And because the nature of this cycle of books is very much based around the essence of literature, of language, of a style, of the relationship we have with books as readers or writers as publishers or people who exist around the world of books. I always thought it would be a betrayal of their nature to try to exploit them in a different medium just to make them more popular or try to make more money through it. There's nothing wrong about that. There's nothing wrong about making money, making movies or things like that. But I like to think that that money I'm not making by not popularizing these books through the movies or through TV series is the price I pay to keep them as I feel they should stay. Because I think there's something about their essence that has to do with books, with the written word, with the beauty of literature. And this is what I'm trying to celebrate. And this is what I'm trying to invite the readers to think about. So I don't want to sell them. I don't want to transform them into anything else because also... I think that one of the tr things I was trying to do with these books was to incorporate what I was saying before, this uh, engineering of storytelling that we have learned from many places. And one of these places is audiovisual narratives, is TV, is, is, is cinema, is many different things. And I think all these layers are also in the books. So the books, yes, are very cinematic, are very visual. And when you start reading them, you get this sense. This is where so many readers say, wow, this would make a fantastic movie because they already seen the movie. The minute you open the book, the movie is being projected in the theater of your brain in great cinematography, fantastic sound with the greatest musical score. So you've already seen them. Try to making it would be redundant, would be unnecessary. And I think that I may be naive or romantic, but I still think that nothing tells a story with the richness, with the wonder, and with the complexity that a novel does if it's done right. And for these reasons and others, there will never be a movie out of The Shadow of the Wind, The Angel's Game, The Prisoner of Heaven, or the fourth novel. Because readers have already seen this movie in their mind, and because the books are about books and about the written word. Dans Le Prisonnier du Ciel, on retrouve ce cimetière des livres oubliés qui a fait fantasmer beaucoup de lecteurs, qui est une vieille librairie, mais qui est beaucoup, beaucoup plus. Comment est-ce que vous avez imaginé cette métaphore pour le souvenir, la mémoire de, des œuvres d'art qui nous tiennent à cœur This happened probably, it was in 1998, 1999. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. I had been living in the United States for four or five years. And at the time, I was very concerned about the destruction of memory, the destruction of the past. Maybe this was an effect of me coming from Western Europe, from a very old city as Barcelona, and coming to Los Angeles, in which everything seems new. Which is an illusion, because Los Angeles is a much older place than it seems. But if you drive around it, or walk, if you walk in Los Angeles, around it, you seem to feel that everything is very recent. And to me, this was very intriguing. I felt that it seemed like at night there was a brigade of people who went around trying to make disappear anything that was too old, so you couldn't even wonder about the past. And and maybe this made me made me ask a number of questions about memory, about identity, about collective memory. And this image of a place that was a metaphor, not just for forgotten books, but for forgotten people, for forgotten ideas, for 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 memories of, of what makes us human became very intriguing. And I started to think about this place, and I started to find that there was a story behind it. So this is when I started to, to design the characters, the plot, and everything. But the first impulse was this concern I was having about the way we were losing our identity by forgetting the past. Because I think we are essentially, as human beings, we are what we remember. The less we remember, the less we are. And this was the origin of the story. Mm -hmm. 